Hi, I'm Judy Cole, the Executive Vice President and CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this web production of the MIT Alumni Association. Please welcome to the stage, Linda Griffith. It's really terrific to be here today with all these wonderful MIT alumni. We learned such an incredible amount from alumni when they visit and share their outside experiences with us. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is something we've been working on for almost 20 years, but has really heated up in the past decade as the needs have become more and more apparent, and particularly the realization of, of two things. One, mice are not little people. I know you know that, but the drug industry is just really discovering that. And secondly, the human genome is not going to give us all the answers to solving disease. Many, many diseases like arthritis, Alzheimer's, and many others may have some kind of genetic association, but there are gene-environment interactions that play out that make different populations of patients different. So you can have the same disease, but there's subsets in different patient populations. So this has stimulated a tremendous amount of effort in the department to think about how we can classify patients and use the ways that information flows in people to build the patient in the dish by design. And I'm going to start out with several other talks in this morning's session will touch on these themes and our collaborators of ours. So it's, we've cured so many mice. About 100 million mice are used every year in disease. So we've cured them of diabetes. We've cured many mice of all kinds of cancer. And believe it or not, we've actually cured them of male pattern baldness using a cancer drug. <laughs> Details on that at lunch. Um, so you see me later if you want the secret drug that's on there. Um, but how are we doing at curing people, okay? And so few of these advances in mice translate to people as we know. So I want to start out with a vignette about an MIT student, a disease that um, is actually fairly common among MIT students now that there are more women here. And it's a particular student. She was in Course 6, graduated a couple of years, a couple of years ago. And she was recognized by the uh, former department head, John Goodtag, as a superstar student. He asked her to TA his class, and she said, when I talked to him about her, he said, you know, she's very flaky. She, she won't TA. She said she'd just grade the homework. I don't understand it. It turns out she was really sick, and she had been not diagnosed. She had been told she was stressed, she couldn't, like, deal with MIT, et cetera, et cetera, but in fact, she had a disease that often goes underdiagnosed, and I have, I know this because so many of our students have ended up having it. It's called endometriosis, and I'm showing you here here, a schematic diagram of the uterus, and the uterus has a lining with epithelial cells and stroma, as shown in the blow-up. If I can get the pointer to work, well, it doesn't really matter. You can see the blow-up. And what happens is bits of that lining, every month in women, it goes out the fallopian tubes and into the peritoneal cavity. And normally, the immune system, in the, there's fluid in your abdominal cavity. It has immune cells in it. It's called peritoneal fluid. It, and they normally eat up the debris that shows up in the peritoneal cavity. But in some women, the, this tissue sticks and grows, shown here as an endometriosis lesion, growing there. Okay, this can cause, so that's a schematic, and what it actually looks like is shown here in one picture, I'll show you another one. So you get these bits, and they can get very big, and they're incredibly painful. So it's chronic inflammation that can start when girls are 12 years old, or even younger and go even past menopause. About 10% of women have this and other associated diseases. And yet, drug development has almost completely stalled. I just got back from the World Congress on Endometriosis, which is held every third, uh, three years, international meeting. Um, in fact, our, our work won the top poster award there, and I'll show you some of it, because people are so interested in how can we possibly develop drugs that are not immune modulators. So you're 
causing to treat this, you cause menopause in girls who are as young as 15. There's got to be a better way. And especially because this is not cancer, but it's, it's really not benign. It can invade into underlying tissue so much that it can compromise your life. This is a patient from a collaborator in Brazil. She had endometriosis invade into her bowel so bad she couldn't poop. And so she had to have a whole bunch of her bowel cut out so she could even carry out her normal functions. This is not okay, but there's really almost no federal funding for this. In fact, NIH only just two years ago created a gynecology branch, and, and um, this is something that we hope will change more in the future. Now, very exciting thing happened a few years ago. Um, endometriosis got cured in rats using a new drug that had been developed for other chronic inflammatory diseases. It's something called a June kinase inhibitor. And the June kinase inhibitor inhibits a specific signaling pathway. When this drug cured the animals, it actually also cured baboons, they had no idea how it was working. They just did this model and said, aha, looks good. We're going to take it into the clinic. And a company in Europe did a clinical trial, and it didn't work. Um, and so the trial failed, and the drug is still out there. So why did these rats get cured? Now, one thing you got to know, and these uh, rats and mice, um, these rodents are all the same. And that's like a feature when you're doing studies in rodents, because they can all be the same, and you can look at mechanism. Um, but in fact, it, with most diseases, the people who get them are different. Every patient is different. Now, typically, we're getting better and better about grouping patients into categories. So, for example, when I got breast cancer a few years ago, immediately there were three genetic markers that they tested for, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2, a growth factor receptor. And these are used around the world to classify breast cancer patients. And it tells you how aggressive the tumor is, but they are, and, and what the therapy should be, and what the prognosis is. And they are mechanistically related to all of these features of the disease. So they can really gate you to targeted therapies for the tumor. And now, unfortunately, I wasn't able to take targeted therapies, but did fine with regular chemo. But what is really great is patients who have the targeted therapies can have a much milder chemotherapy. So how can we do this for diseases like endometriosis? Well, can we do this? What's really hard is in cancer, there are genetic mutations we can test for. That doesn't happen in endometriosis. There are no uh, really, really good uh, studies of genetic mutations. And that's not surprising. Lots of diseases are believed to be interactions between genes and environment. Exposure to environmental chemicals or stress or infection can do what are called epigenetic modifications to uh, the genome. And those epigenetic modifications then can cause changes in the way that proteins are expressed, and then proteins are interacting in networks. So we wouldn't necessarily catch things by looking at the genome. And in fact, this has been very frustrating in endometriosis. So we set out to ask the question, are there other ways we could think about classifying these patients if we conceptualize the biology? And some of you may recognize on this slide Padma Lakshmi of Top Chef. She's actually a really good friend of our Center for Gynepathology Research at MIT. She has endometriosis and has really worked with us to raise awareness among young people. Um, and so we set out, so how do we do this? Well, we start with thinking about the networks of communication that cells have with each other. We conceptualize the uh, cell as a signal processing, information processing unit. So it gets signals from the outside world, shown here, inflammation, drugs, et cetera. And it has a set of signal transduction pathways that we can model, information flow. And then it does something. It survives, it invades, it causes inflammation, et cetera. And a huge uh, amount of effort in the department goes toward trying to understand how these cell responses, how might a cell invade into the bowel, how is that a function of the signals? How, what is the information processing that leads to that? Conceptualizing the biology this way really helps you deal with the complexity. It helps you think about information flow and what do you need to measure, sort of like monitoring um, telephone, cell phones 
to de detect al-Qaeda? How do you get the bad network out of all of these signals going on? So it's really a lot of conceptualizing the biology. So when we thought about endometriosis, we said, well, it's inflammation. Let's go to the place the disease is in that peritoneal fluid shown on the left. What's great about that, you can teach any surgeon how to collect that fluid. And we've done this in Singapore and Brazil and Norway and other places after we did our initial study. And we said, you know, if the immune system is clearly involved, there's some kind of network of communication that we ought to be able to figure out and figure out if it's the same in some groups of patients who have the worst symptoms. So that's what we did. We measured a whole bunch of molecules in this peritoneal fluid associated with inflammation. And we're engineers, so we don't have a favorite pathway. You know, biologists often get a favorite path. We, we love all the pathways because they work together in networks that cripple the patient. We took all these measurements from all the patients and we said, can we use some kind of machine learning method? We used a method that Netflix uses to tell you what kind of movies you should watch. Um, and we were able to figure out a small group of patients, about a third of them, who had a particular signature, a particular network dysregulation, and that had worse symptoms. And what's really important and what's really critical and is leading now to new drug, in drug company interest in that June kinase inhibitor, we went and got cells from the peritoneal fluid of patients. We predicted that June kinase in that small subset of patients, not all of them, just a subset, that June kinase would be an important regulator of inflammation. And over on the right, I'm showing you that that's what we found. And this was a revelation. So it has reinvigorated the drug companies wanting to work with us. But they said, you know, we're still scared. Even though you got these markers and we sort of saw them in our initial trial in that subset of patients, we need models of efficacy. How are these going to work in real patients? So now we're building the patient in the lab. And there's a demo outside you can go see with some of the tools we have. But part of it is to build really, really reproducible microenvironments. So you're seeing here endometrial cells um, from women encapsulated in a synthetic hydrogel. It's sort of like a contact lens, but it's very gentle, and it tells the cells how to grow as though they're in the body. And I'm not going to go into all the details, but tell you that the really crucial thing is to bring the immune system in to the in vitro cultures. So we're now bringing patients their whole endometrium and even their peritoneum, and we're bringing the immune system in. You can see on the right, immune cells crawling around inside of a 3D human endometrium we grew in culture, okay? And so that's the end of the vignette about endometriosis. We are now talking to drug companies, even thinking of starting a company ourselves, to take, so now we can do models of efficacy to see how this drug uh, actually works on different subsets of patients with their tissues in the lab so that we can relieve the stress that students have from undiagnosed diseases like endometriosis. They already, you, you may remember taking exams and being that stress. Now, just a, a few more vignettes. These It's very hard to get funding for endometriosis, so we support our work a lot of other ways. These same methods we're using to study pediatric brain tumors with the, um, with the Dana-Farber. This is with Ross Siegel's lab. These are tumors that couldn't be grown in culture, and we're now growing them in culture, and it's really very early stages, but many different kinds of tumors. All of these are from uh, children who, who didn't survive. You'll hear from Eric Alm about the microbiome. We're building models of how the gut, the microbes in the gut, leak through the gut and interact with the liver to cause things like liver toxicity, changes in immunology. So on the left, you normally have microbes. A little bit leaks to the liver through the gut, but a whole bunch to do that. Uh, when a whole bunch do, you can get all kind of uh, problems. So to do this, we're adapting these same methods of bringing the patient into the lab to now build little models of the gut. And what you see here, this is a movie of an organoid taken from an intestinal biopsy growing in a gel in culture, and we can combine that also with the immune cells. But what's more exciting, and you'll hear more about this uh, from Ron Weiss next, is we're also using approaches where you take the cells from an adult and turn them back into 
uh, pl pluripotent stem cells and then get them to grow into a gut. And this is in collaboration with someone at Cincinnati Children's Hospital who invented the method. And he came to us and said, you know, we can get these cells to turn into little gut organoids, but it's really inefficient. Only about 1% of them do. So we've worked with him now, showing you uh, work just published, to improve the efficiency of this because you're never going to get it into practical use unless it's efficient. Um, and we're, you can't just grow things in static cultures, so a huge effort in our department in collaboration with Roger Cam involves getting little blood vessels to grow. And so building these organs, so-called organs on chips, you can see on the left, uh, into blood vessel cells growing into vessels and tumor cells moving through the vessels, and then on the right, still pictures of a tumor cell moving through the vessel wall into the tissue, and then we're using this also to support pancreatic islets and study even more complex diseases like metastasis to the liver. On the upper right, there's a little nest of red cells that are uh, tumor cells quiescent in a liver, and we're trying to understand how they respond to chemotherapy drugs. So those are just some examples of how we're bringing the patient into the lab, really thinking about how do we capture the biology we need to know using systems biology to humanize the entire process of drug development. Thanks. Thanks again for joining us. For more information on future MIT Alumni Association productions, please visit our website.